Welcome to Restoring Your Voice, where I'm here to restore, prepare, and equip you. Alrighty then, welcome. Welcome, welcome everybody. This is Pastor David. Try, I'm doing a, uh, this is the live Bible-based Q&A. Now, just because I say Bible-based, now that doesn't necessarily mean that's for Christians only, right? If you're not a Christian, ask ask your questions, challenge. Or maybe uh, you say you are a Christian, but you want to say that, we'll say the Trinity is false. It was made up at the Nicene Council or something like that, or that Jesus isn't God. And you, you want to fire away at me with your best ones, go ahead, all right? When we, if we disagree, we disagree. That's fine. It's still iron sharpening iron. I see no problem with that. The only thing I ask is if we're going to disagree, let's disagree amicably. That's all I ask. Simple question, right? Maybe you think it's okay to be gay and Christian. Maybe you think it's okay to have same-sex attractions. I don't know. Maybe you think the King James Version is the only translation to read. Something, I don't know. Maybe you think Islam is a true religion. Maybe you think Jehovah's Witness or Mormons or is true religion is are the one true right thing. I don't know. I'm just putting that out there. Bottom line is this is your chance live, right? Whether you, you whatever the case may be. All right, I'm not gonna get offended at anything. All right, I'm trying that. So anyway, with all that out of the way, all right. And I said, okay, why am I doing it today? Well, yesterday, right? If you missed it, I did a great show with uh, a new friend Scott Volk. Now Scott Volk is a long time friend over 30 years with Dr. Brown okay I had him on the show yesterday and we talked about uh, the Jewishness of Jesus the Jewish roots of Christianity how important all of this is things like that so if you missed it you need to go back and watch it um, you need to go back and watch it okay trust me if you want to know how to bless Israel if you want to know how to bless the Jewish people all right, if you want to know how to bless the Arab people over there, then go watch the show. So, I just said, this is your time. Now, if you ask a question and I don't answer it to your satisfaction, you can ask again, you can ask for clarification. Just please, when you ask a question, um, don't be, don't, don't try to be very vague because if I don't, it's in the chat. So, I can't read and understand something if it's vague, right? So I may ask you for a clarifying question, a clarifying question to clarify what you're asking as well. So just be prepared to do so, please. Okay, okay, okay. Um, ah, Eric asks, um, should modern day Christians read the Didache? Yeah, absolutely. I've read it myself. It's By the way, it's free online. Um, you just look it up, searching um, D-I-D-A-C-H-E, D-I-D-A-C-E. H E and read it. It's a good one. It's great to, to see what did the early church fathers believe in regards to, to lots of different things. Okay. Um, uh, if you wonder what, what is the Didache? What, what am I even talking about here? You have never heard of it in your lifetime. It's an early church document attributed to the apostles. Um, we don't know for sure who, who wrote it, but it's attributed to the apostles. Um, and, and it covers a lot of different things. It covers everything from baptism to how to treat prophets to what a false prophet is. Now, word of caution, though, if you're going to read it, make sure you you know what Scripture says. Because not everything in there agrees with Scripture. For instance, in the Didache, um, they say what the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is, but it's not what I, Scripture says, something completely different about what, what the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is, for instance. That's just one instance, but it's good to know, like, like, especially in, in our modern day where so many people claim to be prophets, but they're really just asking you for money. And like, for instance, the, the dedicate makes it clear that if a prophet goes around asking for money, right, especially money to prophesy, then they're a false prophet, which is oh, which is great. So either way, read it, just ensure you read it and filter it through the lens of scripture. That's all. That's all I'm saying on that. So great question. You know, a lot of people don't know what the dedicate is. I mean. I, I I didn't always know what it was. So anyway, so okay. Um, this is a good question. I might, let me look this up real quick here. So Richard asks, "What is the gate revisionist theory?" I've never heard of it, so I'm gonna have to look it up myself because I've never heard of that term. Excuse me. 
type it in the all almighty, almighty googly uh gate uh, let's see almighty googly i don't even know how i'm, how I'm spelling this revision I even spell that right. And, uh, let's see. I can't copy something from here. Revish. Okay. Gate. I have to. I'm gonna have to look this up. Revisionist theory. Never heard of it. Um. Gate revisionist theory. Let me see. Make sure I type that in right. Yes, I did. Um. So we have revisionist theology. Uh, this one says. Uh, refers to, in its narrow sense, a specific for, formal model of the method of fundamental theology. Okay. Revisionism, if you're talking about that, is Marxism. Um, so mainly, let's see, a number of contexts refer to different revisions or claims, revisions of Marxist theory. Um so far right now, all signs point to a version of Marxism, but I've never um, heard of this. this is the first, I think gate revision is the first I've ever heard of that term. Uh, real quick here. Okay. Um, there we go. Gate rediscovered. Him. Uh, yeah. So anyway, I don't have, a, I don't have really have an, an answer solved other than what I just found on the internet. Cause Hey, I'm an honest person. If I didn't know something, I'm not going to try to claim, oh, yeah, I know all about it. So it looks like it points to Marxism, and that's probably the best That's the best answer I can give on that. Anyway, uh, so scrolling down. Um, let's see. Ah, Mr. Deckard here asks, why did Jesus call the Canaanite woman a dog in Matthew chapter 15? So let's bring that up on the screen first and foremost. Let me switch this around here. There we go. So Matthew chapter 15. Let's let's go to Matthew 15. Let's see. What was he doing there? Was he a bad guy calling him or, or what? Let me bring it up on the screen first for you guys. So let's see. Matthew 15, 21 through 28. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Let's see. Let me, let me switch translations real quick. So deep Bible study like this, I like to use the uh, New English translation, the NET. So Matthew 15, uh, 21 through 28. There we go. So going out, Jesus went to the region of Tyre and Sidon. So can that woman cried out, mercy on me. And he answered, uh, is that right? Take me to the. Ah, uh, here he is. Uh, let's see. It says here, or lap dogs or house dogs here in the footnote, as opposed to the dogs on the street. The diminutive form originally referred to puppies or little dogs, okay, then to house pets, okay. Some Hellenistic uh, uses of uh, Kunarion simply means dog. Um, so the term dogs does not refer to wild dogs or scavenging in this context, but to small dogs. Taken in his house pets. It is thus not, did you hear that audience? Not a derogatory term per se, but in, in but is instead intended by Jesus to indicate the privileged position of the Jews, right? Because we see before that where Jesus specifically mentions that at that point he only came to the lost house, the lost sheep of Israel, right? So during his earthly ministry, it was only to Israel. Okay, it wasn't until 10 years after his ascension that that the um, Gentiles were grafted in, by the way. So, there you go. So the woman's, anyway, but is instead intended to, to Jesus to indicate the privileged position of the Jews um, as the initial recipient of Jesus' ministry, right? We know also, also our salvation is first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. The woman's response of faith and her willingness to accept whatever Jesus would offer pleased him to such an extent that he granted her request. So there you go. So definitely it was not in a derogatory sense, but great question. Um, yeah, wonderful question. Okay, Richard here says, um, are Christians supposed to physically fight back during the Great Tribulation? Okay, let, let me let me uh, try to put it this way. Okay, if somebody came 
to try to steal your family away or harm your family in some way, right? What would you do about it? What what would be the right thing to do? Would it would it would it be right to simply lay down and let and let harm come to your family, or would it be best to do anything possible to preserve their life? Right, I would say to preserve their life because I'm going to tell you right now. Somebody tries to come against my family in such a way as that. Say what may may would happen in the Great Tribulation, perhaps. Right, you guarantee, you guarantee somebody's getting shot. Right, somebody's getting shot when if they if they're if they're going to try that way. Right, it may offend people, but um, you know. Pacifism has no place in Christianity. Let me put it this way. Right now, we're not supposed to be the aggressors, but Christianity is far from a passive religion, right? Um, people forget that the whole word of God is the whole word of God from Genesis to Revelation. And yes, we can indeed take up arms. There's nothing wrong with that, right? When appropriate. So I'll, I'll just answer it that way. Um, let's see. Okay. Uh, okay, here we go. Here's another question by Richard. Is there room for nuances in Scripture, or should we take everything at face value? Well, there is no room for certain things for nuance, right? Like, is the Trinity true all the way? Or There's no room for that, right? There, there's no room for nuance that Jesus is the only way, that Jesus is God, for instance, right? But there are a lot of secondary issues, in other words, non-salvific issues, that there's room for for nuance in there, right? Whether we agree or disagree doesn't mean, you know, that we that we need to hold fast to them to 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 a degree, right? The major issues there's no room for nuance on, right? The Trinity is true, for instance, or only one way to salvation. Jesus has has will return one day, but he has yet to return. There's no room there for, for nuance. Okay, things like that. But other issues like should women be pastors or deacons, right? Now, I don't hold to that, but there's room for, for nuance in there, right? There, there's room in there for people who hold differently than I do, right? Because it's not going to affect people's salvation, for instance. Um, even the gifts of the Spirit that I hold to, that the gifts of the Spirit are true and for today, right? But somebody doesn't hold to that. It's 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 non salvific, and they can still be my brother, sister, and Lord. Uh, many other, many many secondary issues. What about creationism? Uh, can we say that Genesis is literally true in every sense of the word? That God took a literal six days to create Earth, or is there room for nuance in there that could have been uh, a different time frame, or maybe that Genesis wasn't specifically alluding to any specific time frame? Yeah, there's room for nuance in there. It's not going to affect salvation. So there's, there is room for nuance. There is no room for nuance, however, in the scriptures to say that some parts of scripture aren't true because either all of scripture is true or none of it is true. So wonderful, wonderful question. Um, let's see. Moving down here. So, yeah, great question so far. You know, you know it's amazing that I, that, I, that I give people the opportunity here to disagree with me, by the way. I give them the opportunity here. I say it all the time. When I try to put it out there. You know, non-Christians are more than welcome. But I have maybe one time or twice at the most seen people come in here to challenge me on things that they disagree. But this is this is the opportunity to do it. Right? Don't hold back. Right? Let it all out there in the chat. Go ahead. And say, you know what? You're so wrong on this. Blah, blah, blah. Fine. This is your chance. Don't say I didn't give you a chance. Um, let's see. Richard here says, Why was Noah instructed to take seven pairs of the clean animals on the ark? Good question. Uh I'm gonna look it up. And while I'm looking it up, I am gonna say I would think because seven is the number of completion in the Bible. If you wherever you see the word seven or the number seven signifies completion, right? Like God created right the world in six days, right? And the seventh day signifying it was done, he rested, for instance. 
So let me go look that up, though. Let's see. Let me see where I can find it at. Because John, or sorry, Noah, seven pairs of animals. I'm not sure where to find that at. Noah, seven pairs of. Let me see where that's at. Okay. Seven pair of every clean animal. Okay. Genesis 7, 2. Okay. Got it. Genesis 7, 2. Let's look up Genesis 7, 2. Okay, so here it is. All right there. It says, you are, you must take with you seven pairs of every kind of clean animal. So let's see here. Uh, since seven is an odd number and seven is qualified as male and female, only seven pairs can match the description. So saying, saying seven pairs, okay. Uh, not seven animals of every kind. Right here. This here says, nope, still not answering my question. The male and his mate, okay. And it says two of every kind. So I don't have, let's see. I don't have a solid answer for that. Um, I don't, never really thought about it. Um, but good question nonetheless. Um, Eric here says below that, he says seven is also the number of, of a holy dedication. Could be that too. Um, but we don't know. Where, it doesn't specifically state it's just a command. Um, so we don't know. We won't know for sure. And I can't give you a 100% solid answer. Uh, I see Mr. Decker says here in Job. Um, I think he forgot to mention the chapter number. Anyway. It is mentioned a it mentions a behemoth, and is that a metaphorical title for the devil? No, nope, not at all metaphor. Nope, not not a metaphorical title at all for the devil. Okay. Um. Let's see. Farmhouse Living Scott says Israel is on a seventy fifth birthday, right? Since being reborn as a nation, I wonder if. They turn 77 if it will kick off the tribulation. I don't know. There's this. There's no substance to that whatsoever. Nobody knows, right? Because if if it was a sure thing that the great tribulation would kick off on the 77th, then then obviously what scripture says would be not true, and we would know the day or the hour, right? But we don't. Since we don't know, uh, there, there's no substance at all about um, se seven. Um, uh, being 77 being having any substance, so yeah, I would stay away from that kind of stuff and that kind of thought if I were you and never released anything good. Um, so yeah, great questions, though, nonetheless, right? Well, I always say it's no such thing as a stupid question here, so um, you know, whatever question you ask, I guarantee 100% guarantee somebody else out there has the um. The same um, question, and you're going to help them answer it. So, great questions. Like I said, anything. I don't care if you disagree with me or not, right? Um, it doesn't matter. Agree or disagree. It's not mattering right now. Um, all I care about is that we reason together, and we do it amic uh, amicably. Um, <laughs> yeah, I always say that when I ask, well... Not always. We ask plenty of other good questions. Um, no, I don't always say that. Um, anyway. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> mm. So now I'm coughing up stuff in my lungs now. So in case you're wondering what's going on. So I just successfully quit smoking. So thank you. Thank you for all your prayers out there. To help me get over that three-day um, hump of that. So let's see, Richard says here, um, why does Satan's lies and accusations seem to speak louder than the word of God? Well, I wouldn't say they always speak louder than the word of God, but I'll be talking about this more in depth right after this, by the way. I'm going to be talking about our thought life, right? Because where, where do we hear Satan's lies and accusations is in our thought life, right? But but to give a fair answer, I think 
it has to do with part partially because we don't always believe the word of God fully, right? God says we're forgiven. He, the Holy One, forgives us, right? And cast our sin as far as the east is from the west, right? Into the deepest part of the sea, never to be remembered. So God doesn't hold sin against us once we're forgiven. Once, for, once we're forgiven in God's sight, it's like it never happened. Never, right? Completely erased, gone. He doesn't hold it against us. He doesn't even remember it. Okay? But sometimes we have trouble believing the Word of God and applying the Word of God to ourselves. Right? And we all do that, right? And so it's not like that it necessarily speaks louder. It's, I think, what it has to do that we what we choose to believe and what we choose to apply. And, of course, some people, um, they don't really read the Word of God very often. They don't meditate on it day and night like the Bible tells us to do. Right? And, therefore, um, Satan's accusations against us bear more weight because we don't have enough of the Word of God within us and we don't you know keep it in us and we don't apply it so i think that's one of the reasons why of course another reason why would his his accusations seem to speak louder than the word of god well that would also indicate maybe somebody's living in sin right they they have sin in their life and they're, and they're and they're not repenting of it well of course his lies and accusations are going to speak volumes in that person's life right um say for instance you watch pornography Right, but in your head, maybe you go to one of those those flaky churches that says you can watch porn and be a Christian, right? But you can't. You can't be. You can't do that. Now, you cannot be addicted to porn and watch a Christian. You can't lo live a lustful life and, and, and be okay with God, right? And so you think, well, why is why is why, why are these lies and accusations? I'm, I'm a saved, I'm born again believer. Well, actually, it's not. So therefore, those accusations actually bear weight. See, something like that. So very good. Okay. Um, okay, Mr. De Decker here says, um, was Peter the leader of the apostles, even though Paul did not let a uh, did a lot of letters and works? No, there's nothing that says that Peter was was the leader of, of the apostles at all. Um I mean, I suppose if you wanted to make a case, I suppose you could say that I don't know, James, the half brother of Jesus, would have better fit that description. Um, only because he was cons he, he was the only apostle or, or the only one I should say allowed into the temple and the Holy of Holies in Jerusalem technically he would fit that better but just there's, there's nobody says that anybody was the head of of the apostles there's nobody there so if you're saying so if you could say like for instance maybe Peter was the Pope right he was in charge of it all there's nothing that points to that either. Uh, I don't see that anywhere in scripture that any of the any of the apostles held themselves to be higher than another. And I don't see where any of the uh, apostles in scripture held one higher than themselves either. Okay, let's see if Scott again here. Who was the most important apostle? I have the answer. Oh, okay. Never mind. Okay, got it. Um Yeah, okay. So anyway, yeah. Um all of them. Exactly. All of them. All who were the greatest apostles? All of them. Right? And who and 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 which of the apostles were uh the least of all? All of them. So there you go. Right, you, you read the reading the writings of Paul, right? He considered himself the least of, of, of anybody. So all right, great question so far. Yeah, I'm glad I was able to get. I'm glad, I'm glad I was able to do this today. And thanks to your prayers out there, I'm able to do this because you guys, you might be watching. You don't know I had a stroke recently. Um, I, I got uh, a week and a half ago is when I got released from the hospital, and uh, you're like, "Well, how are you going to? How are you able to do all this?" Well, praise be to God. God, God is our healer. Amen. All right. The the power of prayer works. Okay. Great question here from Eric. What should our what should be our true understanding of Mary, the mother of God, the uh, Theotokos, right? How about that? Yeah, should, should, like, one, is she the mother of God? Well, that's incorrect. Okay. Right there, as soon as we start calling her the mother of God, we come to a completely incorrect um, conclusion about who Mary is. Okay. Now, 
was Mary, how about, um, was Mary sinless? Was she like, at the time, the greatest person ever alive? No. You say, well, but, 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 but Gabriel said, blessed are you among women, right? He didn't, okay, fine. We could, we could, I, I'm on board with that. I'm not, there's no disagreement there. But is she the greater than any human being living? No. Mary needed forgiveness of sins just as we all did. In fact, if you read elsewhere in scripture, by the way, right, <clears throat> while Jesus is teaching, right, his mother, Mary, and his family all come along to try to get him out of there because they're basically saying, dude, you're crazy. What are you doing? Yeah, Mary was involved in that, right? So was was Mary's belief system true? No, it wasn't true. Obviously, he wasn't off his rocker. No, he didn't need it. He knew exactly what he was doing. But for whatever reason, for instance, Mary thought her son had lost it. And I know I'm, I'm paraphrasing here, but you can find it in Scripture, right? We know where Jesus says, well, who are my mother and who are my brothers? Remember that? So we should hold Mary exactly as Scripture holds her, right? She gave birth to Jesus, and that's it. Now, is, is that a wonderful thing? Yeah. Does it make her blessed? Yeah. Does it make her more blessed than anybody else? No. Does it give her some sort of special privileges and, and power? No. Because let me put it this way. If Mary rejected Jesus, we'll just hypothetically say that she rejected Jesus as, as the way, the truth, and the life, that Mary would, would have ended up in hell. Just saying. So, yeah, we just we treat Mary as exactly as Scripture treats her. That's it. We don't pray to her. We don't speak to her. She's not a saint uh, more than anybody else. She is not on par with the Godhead or anything like that. All right. So, Richard says here, is how involved should Christians be in social issues? We should be involved in, to some degree. Not everybody in the same degree, in other words, but Christians as a whole should be involved in social issues, period. I mean, I said why we got why you think America is so whack today is because Christians decided, nope, sorry, hands off, right? Now we have LGBTQ plus all over the place, right? We have um the belief of systemic racism, right? That's a social issue. Um, right? Homosexuality, transgender, all that are social issues considered, right? Yet the Bible speaks loudly on all of these things. So when we're not involved, what happens? Well, there's no other option than for darkness to take over. When we turn off our light, right? The, we don't. It's not that the darkness is greater than the light. It's just that the light, we've chosen to hide our light under a bushel, under a basket, right? As the Bible says. So yeah, we should actually, absolutely 100% be involved. So yeah, going wonderful question right there. Um, yeah. If we're, if we're not involved, then we have nobody to blame but ourselves when, when things go uh, pear-shaped, honestly. Um, so, yes. And Eric says here about the church fathers uh, debated on her eternal virginity. It was only later that the Roman church said it's an obligation. And for, for those of you who don't know, I think I, yeah, I think I had him on. Yeah. I had Steve Christie on. I think, yeah, he talked, we were talking about the, the Marian dogmas. But anyway, there's five of them. And in case people don't know, the very last one didn't even come around until the 1950s. Check that out. So so if this is something that the church always held to be true, these five Marian dogmas, then why did not come about until the 1950s, the very last one, right? It seems kind of ridiculous um, to make that, assert <laughs> that assertion that the church always held to these things that were not codified until the mid-20th century. See what I'm saying? So yeah. So any vener any um worship slash veneration, which by the way, veneration and worship, exact same thing. Um of somebody is heresy and it's blasphemy and against and it is against the word of God. So um yeah, let me look it up while we're let's just talk about this. Let's see. 
Okay, like I can't remember everything. Um, off the, I mean, it's impossible for me to remember everything. Anyway, uh, Immaculate Conception. Let's look this up. Let's see. I don't know about this. No, I'm not looking for a parish. <laughs> I'm just trying, trying to see if, if on the internet they have when it was. Um, let's see. Or how about this? When? When was proclaimed? Let's try that. How about we'll just we'll just do that. So it says Immaculate Conception, um, the Council of Trent. That's when they made that uh, asserts Mary's freedom from original sin was at the Council of Trent. So, you know, that's kind of also very late. You know, that's we're talking five hundred plus years after after Jesus. Um, so why, why, why wait so long to declare something if it was held to be true through all of church history? See what I'm saying? Uh, Immaculate Conception, yeah, Eric is correct here. It wasn't until 1854 by Pope Pius IX, um, that one. So late, very, very late 19th, uh, well, now I would say mid 19th century. So eight, it says here it was in 1854. So yet again, if the Immaculate Conception of Mary is so true. Why wait 800 plus years to say so if it's always true? So there we go. And Mr. Decker here, I think Mary had has maintained a virginity. Well, I would wholeheartedly disagree because one, the Bible says nothing about it. Right? If the Bible doesn't say it, then... We can't say that it's true, right? Also, the fact that she had other children, right? Um, obviously, I mentioned James, the author of the book of James, Jesus' half-brother, right? Um, also, when remember when they said, hey, your, your mother and your brothers are out there, right? Jesus wasn't like, dude, what? No, he, no, he didn't, he didn't deny that they were his brothers. So if... If, if them being his brothers were not true, then he should have denied it. See what I'm saying? So, yeah, uh, Eric says it's a non-essential belief. I would disagree that it's a very essential belief. Yeah, because, because it's going against Scripture. And if we're going against Scripture, now it starts becoming an essential belief. So when we don't hold um, Scripture to be infallible and true, if we don't go by sola scriptura, Scripture alone, then it becomes a salvation issue. When we, when we look to other sources as divinely inspired, like Scripture, now, 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 now it's a big issue. So now, now it's a now it's a really huge issue, right? And there are many religions. I mean, we have the Eastern Orthodox, we have Roman Catholicism, we have uh, the Coptic Christians, Russian Orthodox. And the like, who who all hold uh, to outside sources of scripture as authoritative as scripture. So some of them, and throughout history, have has held, in fact, church councils, popes, um, things like that, as even more authoritative uh, than scripture. By the way, so there we go. So if if we if we if we elevate scripture, or if we elevate anything to the level of scripture at the very least, if, and especially obviously if we hold it even higher than scripture, then now, now, now it's a very salvific issue because we have to hold the soul scripture. We have to believe it. And if we don't believe soul scripture, then there's not a way we can be saved. All right. Cause man shall not live on bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So, I mean, there, there are many, many ways. My, my, my friend Steve Christie, which I hope to have back on soon, um, I'm sure maybe 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 that'll be a good topic for me to bring up, and we could talk about uh, that. Um, but if you have, if anybody has any other questions on this view of scripture, what is scripture, the authoritative thing on scripture, all of that. Um, if you have any questions, in fact, on what is scripture, is it 66 books or is it not 66 books? Does it include the apocrypha? How do we know that? Well, you, um, uh, you can pick up my friend Steve Christie's book, um, Why Protestant Bibles Are Smaller, for, for a much more in-depth 
view on this way more in depth than I can ever go on. Um, let's see. So do any of, oh, here we go. Mr. Deckard asks here, do any of the laws of Leviticus are still prescribed to the church today? Some of them. Yeah. Um, the laws of sexuality, for instance, right? Um, yeah, that still applies today. How do I know that? Because in Leviticus 18 and chapter 20, God is punishing the nations, right? No, notice, not Israel. He's not punishing the nations for not eating kosher, right? For, for, for mixing fabrics, for not having tassels on their garments, uh, for, for cutting their beards or, or anything like that. So he's not punishing them for that. He's punishing them for two things, for sexual morality, right? In other words, sex outside the boundaries of one man, one woman who are married in the marriage covenant and for sacrificing babies. So, so we know that at the very least, the sexual purity laws are still applicable to us today. We know, okay. Um, I mean, there are other laws in Leviticus about not worshiping other gods, uh, idols, things like that are still applicable today. So very great question because a lot of people do wonder about that type of stuff. Like, do I have to obey the dietary laws? Do I have to get circumcised? Do I have to? And it's like, no. Basically, here, here in a nutshell, if Jesus talked about it, that's what we obey. So Jesus talked about, for instance, sexual purity, right? He didn't mention it. So we have to obey sexual purity, for instance. So that's the best place to start is, is filter it. Okay, there we go. Ah, uh, Jim, welcome. Says Paul was not a disciple, never walked with Jesus, but wrote most of the New Testament. Does that not seem strange? No, not at all. One, one, Jesus showed up to Paul on the road to Damascus, so that doesn't seem strange. Was he a disciple? Yes, he was a disciple. Yeah, all of us who are Christians, who are born again believers, are actual disciples, right? And we should be being discipled by somebody, right? And Paul was discipled, by the way. And we know also that he went away um, to be a tent maker. So, so God called him, right? But, but was Paul? Was, was does that seem strange? Not at all. I mean, obviously, nobody's using, nobody's writing scripture today, for instance. But there are modern day apostles, for instance, right? There have been apostles throughout history, um, who never walked with Jesus, for instance. Um, so, so by the way, the qualification for apostle has nothing to do with whether or not you ever walked with Jesus or not. By the way, since in the book of Acts, for instance, um, they had to cast lots to replace Judas as one, as, as one of the 12. And the person they chose, you know, for instance, they didn't say, well, okay, let's, let's check to see if, 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 if they followed Jesus all their life or not. And there are other apostles mentioned throughout the book of Acts as well. So great question, though. Mm. Uh, right. Um, let's see here. Uh, question. Oh, okay. Um, oh, I missed one. Sorry about that. <laughs> Richard, I apologize. I, I thought I was, uh, it's hard for me to keep track of question, but I'll get, uh, here we go. Here's a question right here. Let me bring up the question. It says, what is your position on doctors actually doing mercy killings? It's, not, it's, uh, it's murder. It's murder, right? They, they, they has, he has no right to take somebody's life and, and, and nobody has a, has a right to take their own life. So what is medical suicide? It's medical murder. It's medical self-murder. And the person who medically takes their own life, if you want to put it that way, there's no chance for them to be forgiven and they'll end up in hell. Okay, that doctor has blood on their hands every time they do that, by the way, too. Can they be forgiven in this lifetime? Yes. But the person who does that will not, uh, will not attain life because there's literally no way for them to ask God for forgiveness after being, after murdering themselves. Literally no way. Um, so there we go. So Richard, if I, let me, let me scroll up and see. Uh, let's see, I did that. I answered that. Uh, answered that question. I'm scrolling down here. Um, answered that question. Uh, let's see. And he would have suffered much for the gospel. Okay, answered that. Um, 
Here we go. Okay. Um, right. So, yeah. So anyway, okay. Good. I had to make sure I, I got all the questions. Um, some sometimes it's hard for me to keep track of of what questions there are. Um, like what would help me keep track of if you're asking a question is to put the word question capital letters in front of your question. That way I know you're you're asking a question, not merely uh, commenting. So there we go. Um I am curious. I wonder, hey, if you're still on Jim, I'm I'm kind of I'm kind of curious about why you why you asked the question about Paul though. It's curious, that's all. Uh so Mr. Deckard asks Suicide is an unfor yes, it is an unfor for unforgivable sin. Yes, yes, like I said, because because we don't ask forgiveness for a sin we're about to commit. That doesn't work that way, right? We would have to ask forgiveness after we committed a sin, right? So maybe after we did drugs and we got high, and now we came down from the high, and now we're in our right minds. Now we can ask forgiveness, right? Name the sin like that, right? Now, say, for instance, somebody murdered somebody else, right? They're still alive. I mean, the person who did that is still alive. So it's after the fact. Can they still ask for forgiveness now because they're still alive? Yes. But there is literally no way for somebody to ask God's forgiveness after the fact when they murdered themselves, right? We know murder is a sin. Thou shall not murder. So if murder is a sin and God commands it, and then we have no way after the fact to ask for forgiveness. And yes, there is no way to um, to be forgiven. So, you know, so we got you guys got about three minutes to ask a question, and then I have to hop off here, um, get things done real quickly, to, so I can hop on and do the next show. And you don't want to miss it, by the way. If you ever struggle with your thought life, um, then you need to watch it. Okay, if you wonder how do I handle intrusive thoughts? How do I have a healthy thought life? Right, things like that, then you need to watch it. So that's what that's what basically in a nutshell, what I'm gonna be talking about right after this. Um some people say it's up to God to decide their internal destiny. Well, no, I would disagree. Well, yes and no. Um, but if God's stance on sin is if we commit a sin and die in that sin, I mean, you know, we know we commit a sin. I'm gonna talk about like say we we're speeding off, but if we if we knowingly we know God's word says thou shalt not murder, right? And we're like, yep, I know what it says, I got it, I'm still gonna do it. There's no chance for us to be forgiven after that. Um right, and of course, of course, Eric does say that the forgiveness of sin does not absolve us of the consequences of sin, correct. Well, there is that too, right? What a man reaps is what he sows. So yeah, look. <clears throat> so good, good stuff today. Great stuff today. I was hoping Jim might have been uh, willing, uh, been able to uh, at, clarify why he asked that question for me. Um, but it looks like he hopped off. Uh, probably hopped on just long enough to ask a question, but that's fine. I, I'm just curious why somebody would ask, like, like want to try and disqualify Paul. Um, uh, it always, it always, it just we, it's just a weird thought pattern that somehow, oh no, Paul couldn't have been this. I'm like, well, I don't, I don't, I don't get that mindset. So anyway, so it looks like uh, we have, um, we have no more questions coming in. So that means I will end, and so I can get ready to do the next show because I got to download this episode that I just did. I got to get it uploaded. Um, and then, so then, I will see you. I will see you in fifteen minutes. All right, I will see you again in fifteen minutes. Be blessed, everybody.